everyone. Uh, good morning. I hope you all enjoyed your morning coffee. I did. Uh, thank you for coming here to hear me. And I also want to thank the 200 OK organizers uh, for bringing me all the way from Israel. So thank you. I'm truly honored. Yay. Yay. <laughs> OK, so yeah, hi. Like uh, you said, my name is May Basaron. You said it right. And I'm a software engineer, I'm a backend developer, and yes, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Yay! <laughs> so I want to tell you about my last semester in college. Um, during that semester, I had 10 courses left to take. 10. That, that's a lot. And yeah, I had to work three times a week. So having to balance between work and college, I had to have the best timetable. So I want to give you an example of how I assembled my timetable, but I'm going to do that with only two courses for the sake of the example. So over here we have a list of courses. Let's say I want to take calculus and assembly. And please notice that I do have classes on Sunday because in Israel we have classes on Sunday. Our day off is Saturday. So and uh, Friday, yeah. So anyway, if I have the list of courses, um, lectures are mandatory and tutorials you can choose from the list. So let's say I chose the Sunday morning lecture and the Sunday morning tutorial for calculus and then the Sunday morning lecture and tutorial on Tuesday for assembly. So when I choose the classes, I want to consider my own constraints and my constraints were I want to have minimum days in school because I don't want to be there if I don't have to. And I want to have minimum clashes between classes. Well, you know, I can't be in two different places at the same time. And I want to have minimum gap between classes because I don't want to wait more than one hour for a class. So now that we're going back to our list of choices, we see that we actually violated one of our, my own constraints because I do have to be at the same time at the assembly lecture and also at the calculus tutorial. And so if we re-choose it, now we solve the constraint, right? Because I chose the calculus on Wednesday instead on Sunday and now it, it works okay. And this is our timetable. Um, we have to go three times a week and we don't have any clashes and we don't have gaps at all between classes. But still that's not good enough because I have to work three times a week, so that's not so good. Be there three times, no. So let's try to re-choose. And now if I go on Sundays to lectures and on Wednesday I go to tutorials, it means that I only have to be there two times a week and it works great. So notice how it took us about what, three minutes, and I knew how to assemble the timetable because I wrote the example. And think about what it would be like to do that with 10 courses. Try to assemble again and again with the pen and paper, and it's kind of frustrating. So what I did, I just said to myself, okay, May, you're a programmer. You can write your own timetable generator. And so that's what I did. And like a good student, I turned to recursion. <laughs> because uh, this is a constraint satisfaction problem. And what is a constraint satisfaction problem? It means that we have constraints, and it means that we have a solution. For us, a solution is a timetable. And the best solution, the best timetable, will be the one that answers all of the constraints. So. I wrote a backtracking algorithm, which is a recursion. It means that it searched for all possible solutions. And I waited, and waited, and waited, and waited, and the recursion never end. And you know, I didn't have that much time because a quick calculation suggested that I might even have to wait about two and a half million years for, you know, to get the best timetable for all the 10 courses and everything that I wanted with the minimum classes and all that. So I was like, okay, stop it. I have to revise uh, my strategy. Maybe I don't need the best timetable. Maybe a good enough timetable is good enough. 
So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk about evolutionary computation or how nature solved my problem. Let's start with natural selection. So the theory of natural selection proposes that the plants and animals that live uh, today on this planet, they are the result of million years of adaptation to the environment um, demands. And so what happens is that at every uh, single moment, a few organisms uh, compete for the same resources that the environment has. Oh no. <laughs> Okay, so then the organisms that manage to get more of these resources, they are the one that will have a better chance of reproducing and have more descendants. And so they are the one that will pass on their qualities to the next generation. And what happens is that the next generation will have the qualities of those stronger organisms, so those qualities will pass forward. So every generation is supposed to be better than the one before. And this is the evolution that happens right there. And so evolutionary computation takes this idea and it transfers it into algorithm, and more specifically uh, to search algorithm, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Before we move on, I would like to tell you that there are four known paradigms for evolutionary computation, and I will not talk about all these four. I will only talk about genetic algorithms, but just so you know, the difference between the, these four um, paradigms is mainly in the representation of the solution, and also in the reproduction part, which we will talk about a little bit later. So yeah, genetic algorithms. Okay, let's go over the classic genetic algorithm uh, flow. So we, first we have to start with um, defining our solution, what a solution is, just like we did with the timetable. We start with generating the initial population, and then we will have the fitness function. And since um, genetic algorithms fall into the category of generate and test algorithms, then this fitness function will be where we assess the grade of each solution. This, the fitness function will determine how good a solution is. Later on, we have these three steps. It's the selection, crossover, and mutation, and all of them together are called a reproduction part because this is where we take the current generation and we reproduce the next generation out of the existing solutions that we already have. So now we're going to dive deeper into the algorithm. We're going to use the timetable um, example. Okay, so. I talked about generating the initial population. The way I did it was uh, randomly. What does it mean? Uh, so remember, a timetable is a solution. Many solutions are a population. And in order to generate a solution, what I did is I went over the list of courses because for me it was mandatory to take each and every course. So I go over the list of courses and I randomly choose a class out of these courses and I throw them in to a timetable. So these are randomized. And so I chose to have a population size of 100 and I will not go into how you choose the population size, but we can talk about it later if anybody wants to. So fitness, now that we have the first generation and we initialize it, and it, I, like I said, it was random. So we want to determine how good a solution is. And this is the evaluation function. And the evaluation function, it represents the requirements of the environment, or the requirements from the solutions to adapt to the environment, just like the animals that they had to adapt to the environment. So what does it mean? You want to have a fitness function that will represent your problem in the best way so that better solutions will definitely get better grade and worse solution will get like, you know, not so good grade. And you also want the fitness function to generate a good range of solutions. 
um, because this is what the whole idea is about. You want the evolution to be good. And if you have a range of um, grades, then this is what makes it possible. So like you see, my fitness function is constructed out of three parts, and I sum them all up. Uh, those three parts are actually the constraints that I talked about before. And I chose to go with lower is better in terms of the grades because this way I could uh, define that each um, grade that, it, that the timetable gets is like a penalty. And you'll see shortly why it worked well for me. So let's start with the easiest constraint. Number of days I have to be in uh, school or in college. So I multiply it with the penalty. If I have more days, I will get a higher grade. And this is the way a penalty worked for me. And that's why it was easier for me to say a lower grade is a better grade. So the example, we have a timetable. Notice that it's just numbers because it fit better into the slide. And so we have two days that we have to be there in college. And the penalty that I chose was 10. And the grade for this timetable for this specific constraint is 20. And so if we move forward to the gaps constraint, what I do here is I just sum all of the gaps that are in a specific timetable. And I multiply it again with the penalty. Over here, we have five hours gap. And so I chose to have the same um, penalty also for the gaps because it wasn't more important than the amount of days that I have to be there. But if you have a constraint that is more important to you, then what you want to do is to give it a higher penalty grade because then it, you will get a higher grade and that will represent that this solution is not as good as it could be. So the grade for this timetable, uh, for this specific constraint of the gaps, it's 50. So all in all, 70 for the entire um, timetable. Notice that we don't have any clashes, that's why the zero in the middle. So let's take a look at a little bit more examples. Okay, so now we have the clashes constraint, and I want to stop here and say something about it. So for some people, if there is a clash, it means that the solution is invalid. They don't wanna mess with this, you know, with time and being in two places. Well, I don't care. I mean, sometimes there is a class that I don't mind that it will clash with another class because maybe I don't wanna go to this specific lecture. So for me, if I got a timetable that had some clashes in it, it wasn't invalid, and this is why I inserted it as a constraint and not, you know, just disqualified the solution and got rid of it at the production time. So it, it, I think it's different for each and every one of you, so please consider this when you do your um, fitness function, when you construct your algorithm, try to think whether something is a complete, you know, invalid or it should be as a constraint. So since it's like a constraint that for me it was more important than the days I uh, in school or the, um, the gaps between classes, I just gave it a higher uh, penalty grade. And so for this timetable, which everything clashes, it got a really um, higher grade than what we saw before. And also one more thing, Please notice that the numbers that you see here, they're complete numbers and very nice. It's not like the specific grades um, that I had in my actual uh, system. I just gave it here so it will be easier for me uh, to, to demonstrate it for you. You can go to my GitHub and check out the real um, you know, numbers that I have there. So yeah, that's the final grade for this uh, timetable. And as you can see, it's not such a good timetable. Okay, so that's the entire um, timetable fitness function. We have the three, the three parts, like I said, it's constructed out of the three constraints. If we had more constraints, it means more parts. And so by the end of the um, uh, system that I uh, 
you know, wrote, the user was able to, insert, you know, to include some of the constraints and some of the constraints, you know, to give up on them. And it was, uh, it was actually pretty nice. So let's move forward. Okay, so the next part is actually the selection, the crossover, and the mutation. And like I said, this is the reproduction part of the algorithm. And what does it mean? It means that this is where we generate the new solution, uh, uh, new solutions out of the existing ones. And we're gonna want to repeat this, uh, these three steps until we have, um, until we have enough solutions. I mean, the selection, the crossover, and the mutation is done each time for each uh, solution. So if I want to generate a population of 100, I would want to repeat this thing 100 times until I have the entire population, an entire new population. But another thing that you can do is decide that you don't want to generate an entire new population. Maybe you want to generate some uh, new population and some to leave from the older generation. So that's also a thing. Okay. So we're going to start with the selection part. Like I said, um, we want to select which solutions will be the parents of the next generation. We have the population, and we want to select which will be the parents. And so the selection part should consider the grades of the solutions, because maybe I want to choose I want the better um, solutions to have a better chance of being chosen in parent, as parents, but I don't want that the worst grade uh, won't have any chance at all of being picked. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So after we chose the solutions that will be the parents of the next generation, we can uh, produce the next uh, solution, which will be the next generation. And like I said, we repeat this until we have enough solutions uh, that construct the next generation. So in the classic um, genetic algorithm, you usually use the roulette wheel selection. And selection reduces diversity and it acts as a force of pushing, pushing quality. So it means that sometimes you want to give all of the great, all of the possible solutions maybe a fair chance, but that's a, a little bit, you know, wild card. It depends on your problem. But maybe I th for me, I think it was better to do it in a way that each solution will have a certain chance. And let's say the green part will be representing the better solutions and the red part which is smaller it will represent the chance of the not so good solutions and it means that everyone has a chance of being picked but not a fair chance so remember how i used uh, you know smaller is better it meant that i need to normalize the grades in order you know to transform it to be uh, at, represented as uh, percentage. So after I normalized the results, this is what I got. And it, what I just did is I generated an array in a size of 100, and so I filled 41 cells with the green solution, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, for the other uh, solutions. And then what I had to do is to get a random number between 0 and 99 and get um, what will be the solution that will be the parent of the next generation. So remember, the selection is not what you choose to move forward to the next generation, it's just the parent. So now that we chose the parent, we want to generate the next generation uh, solutions. So we do that using crossover. And so for crossover, there are many ways to do that. Just because you decided to do the um, you know, the simple genetic algorithm or the traditional genetic algorithm, it doesn't mean that you have to go with the traditional crossover. You can choose whatever crossover that best fits your problem. And I think this is the most important part. And this is what I want you to take from here today. Try to make sure, no, don't try. Make sure 
so that you choose the very best algorithms that best fit your problem, because this is what will determine how good your solutions will be. So yeah, we're going to generate the next generation. I'm going to talk about one-point crossover. Please notice that you can also do it with endpoint crossover. So instead of one point, you can do it with multiple points. You'll see what I mean in just a second. So we have two parents, which is two timetables, and we choose a random point, or you can always choose the same point. Uh, it depends, again, on you. And after you chose the point to do the crossover, then you generate the next um, solution. So what happens here, I took one part uh, from Tuesday and onward uh, from the first uh, parent and then the other part for the second parent, and now we have a new timetable. Okay, so, oh yeah, I want to say something about it. What if we get an invalid timetable? So I already mentioned that before, the, uh, the thing about the invalid solutions. I chose to, um, refer to the in invalid, um, you know, I chose to deal with it in the fitness function part, so it will get just a worst grade, and not in this part. I chose to, move, to let those uh, invalid solutions just be there, and then I'll handle it later on in the fitness function. Another thing you can do is just, you know, do a little check. If you got an invalid solution, discard it, and try to do the selection at a different point, or, may, or maybe with more points instead of one, maybe you wanna cut it in a few different points. Um, and another thing that uh, one point crossover is good for is if it's important for you to uh, keep the order uh, inside the solution. Because for me, it was good to keep the order because I wanted that if I have a good timetable from Sunday until you know Tuesday or Wednesday, I wanna keep that part which is good. And I wanna maybe try to handle the other part which is not as good. And this is why one point crossover was good for uh, this um, specific problem. Okay, mutation. I think this is my favorite <laughs> out of the algorithm and so, I want all of you to stop thinking about timetables, clear your mind, zoom out, and come with me <laughs> to the genetic algorithm game. Doesn't it look fun? <laughs> so yeah, this is a genetic algorithm game written by Kiwan Donegard, and it's out there online. Uh, the link will be in the presentation uh, later if you can't wait to play with this game. Tell you, it's gonna take all of your time, be careful. <laughs> so, this is a frog. I hope you can all see that. If you can't see it's a frog, it's, it's a problem right there. So, the idea of the game is that you have to choose how you want to construct your figure, the, the frog. You can add more muscles or more um, joint points, which is the red um, thing is there, or you know, bones, and then what you want to happen is that this creature will be able to jump around or move around. Um, and you can also play with the um, size of the population and the amount of mutation that you want to have. So let's take a quick look of how this game goes. So I chose uh, Evolve, and what you see over here is many, many frogs trying to make their way somewhere. So weird, I know, but <laughs> yeah. So they're jumping around with their weird legs and muscles. And so what we're going to see in a little bit, for those of you in the back, at generation number 12, it has a 14% fitness. So 14% fitness, it's, it's okay. Um, you see the frog, it managed to jump a little bit. And so all of them together, you see that they're kind of looking the same right now. They're kind of, that's all of them together right there. They're just jumping together. And it's generation number 24. And we're still at fitness 14. So I guess you all know where this is going. I'm gonna tell you, it's just we reached a local maximum. What it means is that we didn't have something to make the solutions evolve and get out of the range that they already got. So it managed to evolve to a certain point and then it got stuck. So 
because, oh, because I don't know if I mentioned it, but because selection part, it reduces the diversity because it keeps you know, using the same solutions. And if you, got, um, if you inserted a too good of a chance for the better solutions, then you know, it's even a higher risk to get to a local maximum. And so this is where mutation comes in. What it means that, if, that you in, to insert mutation, what you do is you want to change one random thing in your solutions. So you can choose to do it either for all of the solutions, you can choose to do it to some of the solutions, and you should choose, I believe you should choose um, one thing to change, because if you do too much of a mutation, you go wildcard, and then you know maybe you'll never get a result, and you will wait two and a half million years for a timetable. Uh, so let's see what it looks like uh, when I inserted some mutation. And again, we have those amazing, beautiful frogs. It's the first generation. They still can't even move. And now we're at generation 11. We have almost 13%. Yeah, we have 13%. And then, well, it will move forward. And you'll see that at generation 17, we're already in 18. You see how it's scattered, right? And before, it, they were all together. And now it's not like that. Um, we already reach 18%, and by the end of this uh, nice GIF, it will be, I think, 23%, something like that, which is pretty good um, for fitness, for that you know, uh, s small amount of generations. So yeah, mutations. Let's go back to the timetable world. I'm sure you all missed it. <laughs> so OK, how will I mutate a timetable? What I did is I just chose to flip, uh, it's called flip bit, but since I'm not uh, showing you the bit uh, string representation, we're going to flip one of the courses. Um, so let's say I chose to change just the assembly uh, tutorial. So I chose one thing to change. I changed it from the Thursday, uh, from the Tuesday tutorial to maybe a Wednesday or a Thursday. And now what I got is you know a clash so maybe i will get a worse timetable maybe i won't get a better result but it's okay because it's not what we wanted it's not that we inserted the mutation in order to get you know specifically better um, solutions we inserted in order to get a wider range of solutions so this is it the reproduction part Remember, we have the selection, then the crossover, a little bit of mutation, and then what you get is the next generation. Okay, the entire algorithm, yay! <laughs> so, I think you all wonder, what happened, May? Did you have the best timetable? Did you go to all the classes? Were you a good student? No, I did not go to all the classes. I just found out it's way better if I study at home and just you know, finish the degree, and then that's it. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's what happened. <laughs> so, genetic algorithm, if you want to go check out the code, it's actually written in C Sharp. I did it with another good friend of mine, uh, so it's out there. Uh, we used a great API, and the link to the API is at the end of this rep uh, presentation. I forgot to put it here, but you'll see it in the last slide. So. I want to show you the code of the general uh, function of this algorithm because I think it will help you to understand the, the flow a little bit better. What we have is the function that gets the constraints as the input and also the list of courses. And then what we return is the last uh, population, which is the last generation, actually. So we start, remember, with initializing the, the population uh, with the list of courses and we said that I randomized it and also then we move forward to the fitness function part we activate the fitness function on all of the population using the list of constraints and after that we choose the number of generations that we want and it's not that I think that you all can't recognize a loop when you see it it's just because I really wanted to highlight where the part of the loop that I talked about before is at. 
So inside this loop, like I said before, we have the reproduction part and the fitness function part, which after I generate the next population, I grade each and every solution in this population, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for the number of generations that I chose. This is it, that's the entire code of the entire algorithm. So it's kind of, it's simple and it's nice to do that. I enjoyed it very much. And I think that once you start experimenting with different ways uh, to do each and every part of the algorithm, you understand how every part affects the solutions. What I did is I just exercised uh, trial and error because I had a lot of time, but I think that I would suggest you to do a little research before you just start trying different uh, codes and a lot of you know <laughs> writing and wasting your hours. Just read something. I, I should have done that, but I don't know. I was like, let's try that. And okay, so yeah, the importance of adapting the algorithm to your problem. Just what I said. <laughs> um, when I graduated from college, I asked my friend uh, Liron, do you think I have good eating habits? I know I can trust you. Well, she looked at me and she said, maybe I think, um, I think maybe you should uh, prepare a little bit of a plan. I'm like, what, you wanna, oh my God, you wanna develop a diet planner? Yes, let's do that. I love you. <laughs> and then, yes, that's what we did. We gave it a nicer name than a diet planner. We called it the nutritionist because, you know, nobody wants to be on a diet. We want to eat good and have good eating habits. So nutritionist, the, what it does is you insert the list of products that you have in your fridge. We just took the nutrition values from uh, an open source uh, database for all the nutrition values of all the products that you just inserted. And so the constraints were the amount of calories you want to eat per day and the amount of carbs you want to eat, the amount of protein, and the amount of fat. And so then what, this, uh, it, what it's doing is it generates uh, just a diet plan for you for a week, and it's written in Node.js. So the difference is that this time I did not use an API. I actually wrote the entire, like all of the parts myself um, in Node.js, and it's also there uh, in GitHub you can go take a look if you want a real good diet. Uh, I don't know if it works. <laughs> so yeah, what I found out that when I, okay, I started you know, implementing the algorithm. I just went on and I did the roulette wheel selection because it's super simple. And I tried and I saw that the performance is not so good. I noticed that the algorithm kind of gets slow in the selection part. And so I searched this time, and I found out that the tournament selection is also, so it also gives um, all of the solutions a chance to be chosen, and better solutions will have better chance to be chosen, but it has better performance, and let's see why. So we have the entire population. Out of this, uh, out of the population, we choose um, the tournament pool, and so after we chose the pool, and the ones that will go into the tournament pool, they will have an equal chance to be chosen because they're chosen you know, randomly. And out of those, we will return the very best one, the fittest solution that we have. So let's take a quick look at a very simple code example. So we have the tournament selection. It gets the population. It means that it gets the current generation that we have in the algorithm. And like I said, we want to, do, uh, to generate the tournament array. We will return the fittest one. And that is done inside this loop, which is going to run until we have enough um, you know, solutions in the tournament uh, pool. Randomly select one solution out of all of these solutions out of all of the population, and we insert it to the pool, and that's it. That's the entire uh, tournament selection. So I hope you guys understand the 
importance of the different parts of the algorithm and specifically how important it is to try and make sure that what you chose and what you um, used is the best one to fit your problem. And let's go over what we had today. So we talked about you have to define your problem. Start with this, you know, define what is a solution. Um, what is a good solution? What is a worst solution? You want to choose a good fitness function that will represent the solutions, uh, that will represent the constraints that you have. You want the fitness function to be able to produce a good range of solutions. And you want that the fitness function will actually give a good grade for the better solutions. And so then, like I said many, many times, you have to choose the reproduction part according to your problem. And so, at the end, you either will have a timetable generator or a diet plan generator, or I don't know, there are so many things you can do with uh, genetic algorithms. Sometimes they even combine genetic algorithms with uh, neural networks. And uh, most of the games that I saw so far that use genetic algorithm, it's actually a combination, just like the game that we saw before. It's a combination with genetic algorithm. So there are two APIs here, one in Clojure, if any of you is crazy enough to do that in Clojure. Um, and there is also one in C Sharp. And that's it. I hope you all enjoyed. So the next generation, will it be the same size as the previous population? So actually, in the timetable uh, system, that's what I did. I kept the, the um, population at the same size. But for the diet planner, I chose to change the size of the population because I wanted to start with just for one day. And then I increased the population. And it was for more days because I had more um, possibilities. I can, you know, we can talk about it if you want. But you don't have to leave it at the same size all the time. It really, really depends on what you want to do. Great. Everything was so clear. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> So yeah, it was a uh, random, the, when I exercised, so I started with the one point crossover because it was super simple. And the point was randomized, you know, where I uh, cut the timetable. But then when I, um, what I saw that it wasn't as good because some parts were always the, part that were cho the parts that were, you know, chosen. So this is why I turned to endpoint crossover. And I, you know, I sliced it in different parts and it was randomized also, both the parts that I sliced it, and each time I randomized which parent I'm going to take which part. So right there, it was good to insert more random uh, you know, solutions, but for other parts in the algorithm, it wasn't as good to insert too much you know, random things. So it depends. It's, so I want to talk about like, you know, separately about the timetable and the nutritionist because I solved it in two different ways. So in the timetable, I didn't actually get too many invalid solutions because for me, an invalid solution was it meant that one of the courses was missing. That's the only in thing that will determine if a solution is invalid. So I checked it right at the at the point of the crossover. If there was one of the, just by the, 
actually the number of courses that were in that specific. I didn't even go uh, through the courses themselves. Just if I got a lower number of courses than what the general number of courses that I have, I just disqualified the solution and I redid the crossover part um, with you know different places. And for the nutritionist, I actually um, handled it in the just in the fitness function, um, and it's just got worse grades. You know, it's just when once it was graded, if there was something missing, or let's say I inserted so something that I think interesting, <laughs> I chose that in the nutritionist, if there are no vegetables at all, then I, that's an invalid solution. So it was it actually got a really really high grade, like you know something that is just super super high, and this is how I managed to, you know, mark it as invalid. But it's still not invalid. It's still there, but really. Bad, bad grade. Yeah, could you, uh, in your selection process, would, would it be possible to say that you can get parent and have them both take them? So, yeah, that's a choice. Uh, well, I was going to say, in that case, you could actually go back to what they were preparing when they learned the higher weight. Also, inside the selection part for the children, to select the best child. So one thing to do is um, you can either do it like, I forgot what it's called, like that what you choose just, oh, elitism. Yeah, you can insert elitism where you can keep either like the best parents and to get, let them move forward to the next generation. And you can either do that or you can do the elitism on the children, you know, also. And it just depends on what you want to achieve. Um, at the timetable world, I didn't do elitism because it was good enough the way it, uh, it was. Um, and for the nutritionist, because it was a wider range of possibilities there, because of many, many products, many ways to construct them together, I did uh, insert elitism. And I took you know, the best um, menus that I got so far, they transferred to the next generation. So it's actually R2D2. I have R2D2 heels, but they were super heavy. So I was like, okay, I'm not gonna bring them. I only have, yeah, did you notice I have Rubik's Cube heels? I don't know. Am I allowed to do that on stage? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you solve this what? <laughs> it doesn't actually move, I checked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you like a, I'm talking about like a machine learning like you I don't know like kind of comparing like the the performance of the humans versus the machine learning. So I don't know what to say about comparing. I read a few articles about comparing between the two and they always come to the same conclusion. I mean, the ones that I read came to the same conclusion that you don't want to compare, you want to combine. Because it's as good as an aid to the you know, uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, because this handles multiple solutions and it doesn't try to make one solution better all the time. It just handles a lot of them. Yeah. Everybody give it up for me. Yay! Thank you, guys. <laughs>